The Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 to 31. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre, and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. So, I'm just going to remind you of the pattern of our what we're doing in Jesus' shape. We're looking at the five main areas of Jesus' ministry, the five areas that Jesus focused on the most, because those really need to be our focus of ministry. The first of these has been people, and we're spending three weeks looking at each of those. So this is the last of the three weeks, looking at people, how Jesus went out to meet with people. There are some interesting and perhaps difficult words in our Bibles. If you've got a Bible in front of you, your translation might be slightly different from the one that Karen read. There are words like, well, my translation says Gentile instead of Greek. Gentile and Greek and Hellenist is used interchangeably in the Bible. It means someone who's not Jewish. It means someone who's beyond that boundary of being part of the family of the Jews. Jesus was, of course, a good Jew. What made you a good Jew was that you came from a family of good Jews, that you could trace your lineage. There's no tradition of evangelism in the Jewish faith. They didn't go out and invite other people in. They were quite a closed group. So you'll find in two of the Gospels that tell us about Jesus, these long lists of which we call genealogies, because that made Jesus a good Jew, being able to trace his lineage all the way back to Adam and Eve, if that was possible. So Jesus was a good Jew, and good Jews stayed with good Jews. Esther, would you mind putting up that slide, please? So you would expect good Jews, and Jesus, of course, was the best of Jews because he was of the Son of God, to stay in the best places, to be where all the good Jews were. And that would have been around the area of Jerusalem. I've got my little pointer here. Oh, which doesn't seem to be working. Oh, yes, it is. There we are. Can you see it? Jerusalem here because that's where the temple was. That's where you would expect Jesus' ministry to be. This is just a map, a representation of of where Jesus' ministry took place. But as you can see, Jesus didn't stay in Jerusalem. He went right to the boundaries, right to the edge. If you look at the top of the map, that's not working again, what is it? That's Tyre in Phoenicia. That was outside of the Jewish area. Jesus has gone about as far as it's possible to go from Jerusalem and to the very edges of the Jewish territory. He's gone to the very edges of where he might expect Jews. So he's not expecting to be with other good Jewish people. He's expecting to be with other people who are non-Jews. In fact, the next line of that reading says... He returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. There's more complicated words, aren't there? So he's going... 
uh, stop working. Oh, no, it hasn't. He's, go he's going from Tyre up here to the Sea of Galilee. Now, Sidon is so high up, it's not actually on this map. So when he's going to the Sea of Galilee, he's not going in a straight line. He is intentionally going into an area where there are non-Jews. The Decapolis are 10 cities full of non-Jews or Gentiles. So Jesus is intentionally going, he's doing something that you wouldn't expect a good Jew to do. And while he's in Tyre, he meets this woman. She is not a Jew. She's a, described as a Syrophoenician. So she's on the, the borders of Phoenicia, which you can see at the top there. But she's right at the northern edge of that, on the, on the border with Syria as well. That's what Syrophoenician means. She comes from that sort of area. Now, the Phoenicians were a seagoing people. If you know any history of the Mediterranean, uh, the oldest ships and wrecks that they find are Phoenician ships. They were uh, peoples of, who traded all around the Mediterranean and North Africa and Europe. They were seagoing people. Jews didn't go to sea. In fact, the Jewish people didn't trust the sea. You'll often find in the Bible, if someone is untrustworthy or something is unsteady or uncertain, there is sea imagery used to describe it. The Jews felt the sea was untrustworthy and unsteady. Now we know that Simon and Andrew and James and John were fishermen, but they were fishermen on this little puddle in the middle of the map. It's not a little puddle really. It's called the Sea of Galilee because it is actually quite large. But as Jews, they very rarely went far from the shore. Even when they went from side to side, they would have gone a long way round, all the way around the edges. They wanted to be able to see the shore. That was the safe bit. So the Phoenicians were untrustworthy because they went to sea. I'm just trying to give you some context of who it is that's speaking to Jesus. First of all, she's a woman. Women had no status in society unless they were married to a man or the daughter of a man. Unfortunately, that's still so true. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but we really need to be praying for the women in Iran. It's an amazing thing that's happening. It's really challenging and many, many of them have been killed. Women throughout the world are still persecuted and made to be invisible. In the society where Jesus lived, that's what women were like. They were supposed to be invisible. She's a Gentile. She's a non-Jew. She's a Phoenician, those untrustworthy people who go to sea. And her daughter has an unclean spirit. So that's four reasons why Jesus or anyone who was a good Jew would have nothing to do with this woman. And as I read this and as I thought about it, I wondered how many times does Jesus find himself with unacceptable women? I wondered if you could think of any instances in the Bible when Jesus is with unacceptable women. Mary Magdalene, yes. Mary Magdalene. There are all sorts of theories about Mary Magdalene, about what her profession might have been. She was certainly a woman without a man. The woman at the well, absolutely, yes. The Samaritan woman, another woman who was unacceptable, who'd been married so many times, and the man that she was with wasn't her husband. Yes, the woman subject to, to bleeding. The woman that was going to be stoned. The woman that was going to be stoned. The one who was caught in adultery. Yes. Yes, the woman that was caught in adultery. It is not possible to be caught in adultery. Caught in the act of adultery 
without there for having been someone else there, and yet it's only the woman who's dragged before Jesus. And of course, there's, there's Mary who, who anointed Jesus' head, the woman who anointed his feet and wiped away, the, the, washed his feet and wiped them with her hair. Jesus is often in the company of those who are on the margins, on the margins. In um, John's Gospel, that wonderful section that we, we read every Christmas, uh, right at the beginning of John's Gospel, and we know the words so well, and I wonder if sometimes those words don't really land in us because we're, they're so familiar, uh, our heads skit, skip over them. The beginning of John's Gospel, verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he, became, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. He first came to the synagogue, and the people didn't want to hear, and so he went out to Galilee. The woman represents a form of marginality. She's geographically marginal. She's a long way from Jerusalem. She's socially at the margins. This is, if you'll excuse me being technical for a while, this is involuntary marginality. Marginality means not just that she's unregarded, she's less likely to be able to access the resources available to those at the centre of society. She's economically disadvantaged. These are expendable people. Those whom trickle-down economics doesn't trickle down to. The structurally marginalised. So within the structure of our society, they are marginalised. Those who are, we could say, were structurally marginalised, whom Jesus comes into contact with, includes forced labourers, day labourers, so the economically insecure, slaves, tenant farmers, those whose homes or living situation is insecure, the poor, the destitute, the ritually unclean, such as those whose home Jesus is in, women, the diseased and infirm, those who through no fault of their own are less able to participate in society because of a chronic or sudden illness or disability, the disabled, the mentally ill, those whose existence depends partly on or wholly on illegal activity because they're unable to support themselves in other ways, those whose services to others are demanded or expected, such as prostitutes, who may have no other way of economic survival. Can you think of any of those in our society? This group in Jesus' time were mostly or wholly Jewish, but there are other groupings who, as well as all these disadvantages, are non-Jews, the ideologically marginalised. They exist in our society as well. Those who choose to live off-grid for one reason or another, those who don't accept or can't accept societal norms, or those who live outside of cultural norms. When we started making a list last week of those on the edges, those who feel isolated, we included groups that we are all part of. The old, the young, young mothers, students, they all look a lot like us. If we're serious about those on the margins, we need to recognise that the margins are very wide and some groups and individuals look nothing like us. Indeed, some are so far from societal norms that they've dropped off the margins entirely. Some of this group who choose to affiliate with non-normative groups can be said to exist in voluntary marginality. 
They choose not to be part of the groups that we want to be part of. There's a word that became popular during COVID times, liminality, being on the edges. And we told ourselves that we were existing in liminal spaces during lockdown. Spaces detached from normality and that this is where God operates because this gave us comfort. This is indeed where God operates, but he operates there not because we are there, We've quickly shunted back into to mainstream society, but because it's occupied by those whose whole existence <coughs> is on the edges of society. A place which for social or theological reasons is extremely uncomfortable for us to be in. That is where we find Jesus. This winter we'll see more who are truly in liminal space, outside of access to help from government and its agencies, outside of social and societal help, because there is no resources, isolated, perhaps confused, alienated. This is where the, the Syrophoenician woman finds herself. No wonder she fights so hard for healing from Jesus, because it's not coming from anywhere else. She argues that the exception to Jesus' self-imposed rules that she's asking Jesus to make doesn't take away from the children. God's love and his provision is endless. This woman's argument is pivotal to the ongoing truth of the gospel with regard to mission to the Gentiles. We need to learn from Jesus about the inclusion of those who are different really different from us. So although Jesus went away to Tyre, presumably to get some time out, he can't remain unrecognised and he responds with compassion despite his own personal needs. For some of us, we need to think about how we respond when we're really tired, and I include myself in that. When we're really weary, when we're busy saying, I need some me time. I need to not bother with anyone else. That's how Jesus was. And yet when this woman approached him, what fills him is love and compassion for her. She isn't demanding precedence. She's asking for inclusion. And this encapsulates the mission of Jesus. And for this, her daughter receives the healing that she needed. Imagine the situation for a minute. Imagine that you were there in that busy, bustling town of lots and lots of different people. What would it have felt like to have had a daughter who was desperately ill and have no access to resources to help her? Think about how much courage it would have needed to have asked Jesus and to be so persistent. And then imagine you're in the place of Jesus. Why might you have needed to take some time out? What is it that makes him respond to the woman and her daughter with healing? When Jesus went to Tyre and then to Sidon and out to the Decapolis, he deliberately follows up this encounter by going to places where he is likely to predominantly or only meet people who are beyond the boundaries of Jewish ministry. It's as if a new chapter has begun. Jesus crossed the boundary to reach the Gentiles and to meet their needs. And we need to think about what that means for our own mission and ministry. God may want us 
to do the work of his kingdom among the most unlikely people and in the most unlikely places. We're very focused on having a new premises, but the blessing of the proposed premises swap is not what we come into, but what we divest ourselves of. We're not to be hermit crabs, scuttling as close as possible to our new shell, so that we're only vulnerable for the minimum amount of time, detaching ourselves from one home and slotting ourselves into another and staying in our shell. Jesus went as far away as it was possible to go to meet with those who were truly marginalised, putting himself and all those who followed him into really uncomfortable places, not just in terms of geography, but in terms of the barriers that we put into our own heads about what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. I may be wrong, but I haven't come across anywhere in the Bible where Jesus says, I am not going to heal you because you are unacceptable. First of all, he loves. First of all, he loves. Who are the people that we encounter who are a different faith, a different culture, live a different life? Are there those that we cross over the road to stay away from? What's Jesus saying into our hearts when we come across people who make us feel really uncomfortable because of their lifestyle choices? Or the fact that they are truly outside of our societal norms? Are we ready for God to show our church family that there are people of different cultures and faiths whom Jesus wants to love and heal? It's really challenging. It really is. Let's pray. Father God, you call those who follow you into the most uncomfortable of places. And we confess that we have hesitated to go there. You charge us to love first, just as you loved us before we even knew you. And we confess that sometimes we judge long before we love. Father God, it's hard and we find it really challenging. But we want to say that we're sorry for the places that we haven't trodden, for the places that we've not gone, for the places inside ourselves where our hearts are hardened and our necks are stiff, sometimes for good theological reasons. Help us to see that your ministry is one of love and acceptance first, that you came to all men and women and children and however people designate themselves, they are all your children. Help us to overcome those boundaries and barriers that we place within our own ministry. Take us into uncomfortable places. Open our eyes, Lord, to see those around us as you see them, to love those we encounter with your love, to heal as you have healed in body, mind and spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.